Okay, it's six o'clock, so we'll start with the workshop. Micro Transit in Kern County by Golden Empire Transit. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> we wanna thank the chair and members of the board first. Um, introduction, my name is DK Fox. I'm the marketing manager for Golden Empire Transit District. And my name is Ricardo Perez. I'm the assistant transit planner. And we thought we'd start with our mission statement, which better reflects what we do. We make life better by connecting people to places one ride at a time. So we've seen that ridership has declined for the past decade. Our service area has grown and Bakersfield lifestyle has changed as well. We want to reconsider our business model to keep up with the changing travel behaviors. So about a year ago, we did a study of best practices regarding alternatives to fixed route transit service through Stantec. And I just want everybody to know we're not, we don't have any plans to change or eliminate service today. We're just adding microtransit into our service model. And the GET team reviewed the options from Stantec and one of them was microtransit, which we implemented on April 7th. So microtransit is a form of public transportation in which routes can be dynamically generated. Public transit agencies like us are viewing this as a possible extension of our offered service, and current trends indicate that microtransit may help increase ridership while decreasing costs. Some of the key concepts of microtransit are that, that it's flexible on-demand service, it's zone-based, it's less expensive than a fixed route, which ultimately would allow us to replace underperforming routes, and it's that personalized ride hail experience similar to what you would see with Uber and Lyft, except we're using our own dedicated fleet. On the technology side, you have the microtransit platform. We define where the service boundary is that microtra microtransit will be deployed. Uh, the dynamic routing algorithm matches you with the best ride possible. So if you need a wheelchair, wheelchair accessible vehicle, one will be dispatched to you. And then lastly, the analytics are archived so we can monitor things like ride times or wait times and make adjustments same day. So if we need to add vehicles because it's busy, we can do that same day or take away when it's slow as well. On the user side, it's a pretty intuitive app. You have the ride hailing component where you can enter an address or drop a pin and the ride will be dispatched to you. The navigation component gives you the estimated time of arrival for that unit. And then lastly, you can pay on the app as well, or you can pay cash on board uh, when the vehicle arrives. And if you don't have a, f a, f a smartphone, you can also call in, and we have a telephone number for you to uh, book a ride as well. So I'm just going to go through the overview. Ride is a new on-demand curb-to-curb shuttle service offered by GET in the southwest area of Bakersfield, which is Highway 99, Panama Lane, Old River Road and Rosedale Highway. Within the zone, rides are $3.50 one way and offered seven days a week as part of the pilot program, which lasts six months. We started on April 7th, and we'll give you more data um, on how we're doing as well on our last slide. Ride can take you anywhere within the zones, restaurants, shopping centers, movies, medical offices, music lessons, and bus stops. You decide where you wanna go and when. Ride does not run on a schedule like fixed route bus service. Ride picks up and delivers riders to their destination on demand like Uber and Lyft. Within the zone and during the hours of operation, riders can go wherever they want. We had combined um, Route 47 and the southern portion of 61, and Route 47 only runs till uh, 7 p.m. on Mondays and Fridays. We've extended it to 11 p.m. to offer our customers extended hours as well. We envision ride microtransit will be useful in parts of our service area that are not quite dense enough to support frequent bus service. Route 47 is eligible for alternative service like microtransit because of low ridership. It, it has an average of 10 passengers per hour and it doesn't operate in the evenings. This route serves the Walmart on Panama, Panama Lane, New Stein to California and the Trucks and Office Park area. The areas along Route 61 south of Rosa Highway are eligible for microtransit as well. The, north, the northern end of this route has good ridership and it operates every 30 minutes, but that southern end has significantly lower ridership and people are required to transfer more. So we think that with uh, microtransit vehicles that can range from large SUVs to vans to shuttle buses, we're able to reach these residential areas a lot easier than we would be with a, a big bus. Um, and we have the 
the potential to positively impact approximately 40,000 residents with this new service. I'm sure you have some questions and we um, <coughs> hope to answer them. Um, one of the questions we have up here on our FAQs is how is Ride different from other rideshare services? Like other rideshare services like Uber and Lyft, Ride will pick you up and take you where you want to go within the service area, but there are some differences. Other rideshare services can use, use surge pricing to charge more during busier times. The ride price stays the same all day at $3.50 one way. Other services employ independent operators. Ride drivers are professionals who have undergone rigorous background checks and safety training. How can I book a ride? To travel on ride, you must start and end your trip within the ride zone. You can schedule a ride trip by, phone, by a, calling a dedicated line or using the mobile, the mobile microtransit app. You can use the app to schedule and pay for your trip. You simply enter your information regarding pickup location and time, the destination, and how you want to pay. Or you can use the app or call, uh, call the dedicated line and pay cash when you board. We just remind everyone that drivers do not carry cash, so please remember to bring exact change. How long will I have to wait for my ride? Our goal is to keep wait times between 15 and 30 minutes, but that may vary depending on demand. If, you're, if you book your trip using the microtransit app, you will receive real-time predictions as soon as a vehicle has been assigned. Your ride will wait at your pickup point for five minutes and send you three text messages to let you know that it's on its way, it's arrived, and that it's leaving. How do I connect outside of the zone? Riders will be picked up and dropped off curb to curb within the zone. If you're traveling outside of the zone, riders can connect to the existing route system at any of the get hubs within the zone. And those are the Southwest Transit Center, the Walmart on Panama, the nor Northwest Promenade, and CSUB. And if you're also waiting, if you're riding uh, and you want to get dropped off at any of the stops for a uh, route that's leaving the zone, you could do that as well. So this is just a picture of um, what it looks like on the app. So there'll be a blue dot that you drop a pin where you are at your address, and then the other dot is letting you know that the estimated time of arrival. So this one says five minutes. I know it's hard to see from here. Um, and then what happens is we, um, we purchased a software called Transloc, and it'll do a algorithm check to see if you need an ADA compliant vehicle. All of our vehicles at this time are ADA compliant and it'll find you the best match possible and then the tablet is in the, the vehicles that the drivers have and they'll find, they'll use Google Maps to find the best route possible to come to your destination. <coughs> So this is what the app looks like. The first time you use the app, the system requires you to log in and create an account with Transloc, and that's the company behind the app. When you open the Microtransit app, you will see the available services. If you are not in the ride zone, uh, Microtransit will not appear on your dashboard. So on that second screen, because you are in the zone, you see the blue card signifying that ride is available for you. Next, you can select the number of passengers that are with you. If you need a wheelchair accessible vehicle, one will be dispatched to you. For a ride pilot, like DK said, all of our units will be wheelchair accessible. And then lastly, you confirm your pickup location and select the drop-off location. Uh, by default, the app drops a pin at your exact GPS location, and once the ride is confirmed, the unit will be dispatched to you. And this is some of the statistics uh, since launch. We launched our service on April 7th. Total rides are actually above 300. More than 300 rides have been given. Uh, the most popular way to book a ride is via the app. The most popular times for booking rides are 1 p.m., 3 p.m., and 4 p.m. The uh, trip duration kind of varies, but it's somewhere between 5 and 20 minutes. And then the ride wait time for the unit to pick you up is also between 5 and 20 minutes. But no uh, total trip time from pickup to drop off has been longer than 30 minutes yet. Uh, the average trip length is 3.5 miles. Three and a half to four miles. Um, and then for rider feedback, we've been getting a lot of positive feedback from um, the community. Um, one rider said, ride has made a huge impact on my life. It's affordable, efficient, and convenient. This is Genesis who uses our service um, every morning um, to go to work and go home. Um, even our uh, riders that use the traditional transit service are incorporating our new service into their daily commute. <laughs> One of our writers said, I wrote it this morning and made my connection to Route 43 downtown on time. And then lastly, there's another woman that lives outside of the zone that hasn't gotten a chance to ride the uh, service yet, 
but she's doing us a favor and handing out flyers because she wants it to be successful so we can expand to her area of town. And that concludes our presentation. There's more information on ridebakersfield.com. That's how the app looks. Uh, and then the units uh, are those as well. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? And i um, been asked to remind you, if you do speak, please turn your microphone on. I have, I have a question. Yes. Did, you, did we end up putting uh, bike racks on... So there are bike racks on it for that first and last mile? Yes, uh, two bike racks per vehicle. Okay. Is the service uh, forecasted to go beyond Bakersfield in Kern County? I don't think we've gotten that far yet with microtransit. We do have some routes that leave the district, like our X92 that goes to Tejon. Um, but at this time, I don't think we've discussed going past uh, the boundaries. The price does include transfers. So, do you want to? Um, it's three dollars and fifty cents one way. If you want to transfer outside of the zone, then you have to pay the fixed route fee. So it does not include transfers. How many vehicles do you have in operation at this time? We have uh, five vehicles in operation at this time. Okay, and um, these vehicles are picking up either. A group of individuals at one location taking them to a second location or a single individual and then taking that individual to a second location they're, they're not picking up other riders along the way there are yeah that's what the algorithm does so if there's so if you're if there's two people heading in the same direction being picked up at a different location it'll pick up both riders and work it into the algorithm that way okay so up to now because you just started the program what is the maximum of riders that you have picked up in any one way? Do you know? I think max load has been three. It's been three so far. Okay. Thank you. There. Oh, how m uh, she wants to know how many does the vehicle sit? Eight. Okay. And two wheelchairs. Thank you. There's a partnership with Airport Bus, too, and there's been people that have used that? Um, yes, we've had a couple calls. Um, so it's the Airport Valley Express, and you're here. <laughs> Hi. Um, basically, uh, if you use um, Ride for $3.50 to get to the Airport Valley Express, they will refund you the $3.50 if you use it to go to LAX. <laughs> we we are at the question time, so if you'd like to go to the microphone, it'd be great. Please state your name, Mr. Rudnick. Uh, my uh, given name is Phil Rudnick. I've inherited the name of Captain Kindness, <laughs> and that's because in our company, everybody is an ambassador of kindness. Uh, first of all, let me just say this. Uh, I am so pleased with uh, uh, Karen King and her organization and GET to come up with this creative idea of helping the com people in our community have relatively door-to-door -door service. Uh, what, what impressed me was that the community through that service is uh, actually showing its commitment to uh, help the environment uh, the, uh, and to maintain uh, the uh, interest in people uh, to use rideshare in our community. So our company, who has a pledge of always with community in mind, felt that we should make an investment in that program, an investment that would allow our people in their service area to call, get driven to our location with a, re with a, with a uh, reservation to LAX, 
and come back the same way, and you can, you can go to LAX. You never have to drive your car. You never have to have a relative take you there. And basically, not only does it, I think, a great service for the community, but it's the kind of thing, hopefully, that other companies will emulate, and we will build more of a motivation for, for that kind of uh, thinking. So we're very pleased to uh, help out, and uh, uh, we're, we're there with our bag of money waiting to give back their three and a half dollars. I will also tell you that uh, I talked to Hashem in Arvin at the Arvin Transit, and we've extended that same offer to them. So they can bring people all the way from Arvin and Lamont, and we have a lot of people that ride with us from there to our place, and we will reimburse them their fare. So that's the kind of thing that our company does in keeping with our pledge of always with community in mind. Any questions? If not, I'll get back to the real business over there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I had one more question is that <laughs> are, are your drivers, if they don't have a call, they just park somewhere or they drive around the way uh, taxi drivers and Uber drivers do? Uh, they they are staged at popular sites so like the Walmart's or Marketplace, um, just so, and we try to spread it out just in case you know there's different there's people booking rides in different parts of the zone. We'll have a car a unit. Available. So if they finish ride and and they don't have a call, then they go back to a staging Correct. spot. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Anybody else? So what is the hours again of operation? It is. Um, it's Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday from 6 to 11 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hope it works out. Yes. <laughs> Us too. How many, how, I just, how many riders is it going to take to make it work for you? From our study, it said that um, four riders per hour per vehicle looks like success. And you've got three three vehicles? Five. Five, okay. And th this week is sort of um, an off week because it's spring holiday, you know, it's spring break. Right, so it it's takes a long time for people. <laughs> yeah, learn, so, so right. I think next week will show a little bit better <laughs> numbers as to. So your, your pilot program is six months? Yes, yes. Mr. Rudnick, you had another yeah, question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a few minutes, uh, I guess we'll wait. Okay, we're 6.30. We will start the Kern Council Government's Transportation Planning Policy Committee meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Thank you. Roll call, please. Garola. Crump. Here. Cantu. Kraut. Yes. Reina. Here. Mauer. Here. P. Smith. Here. Lucinovich. Here. Scribner. B. Smith. I'm here. Couch. Here. Baleo. Cryer. Fit. Here. Kiernan. Present. Para. 
Here. Miller? Here. Van Wyk? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Time for public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Anybody like to speak? Mr. Fox, state your yeah. name, please. Hi, I'm Dennis Fox at 918 Blossom, 93306. And I'd like to give you a caveat. How's that? Maybe they don't want to hear it. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The um, kind of an environmental caveat, and that's to do with using environmental laws for your own benefit for other issues. Currently, there are two habitat plans under consideration. Also, the city of Bakersfield of ungodly why it's just horrible they're putting city is putting houses in the city and this is bad for their quality so we're going to sue and they're backed up with envi the environment the uh, money from the sierra club so it's subsidized and they've been doing this for years over and over even though the persons involved live in bakersfield work in downtown LA and drive cars that exude blue smoke, blue, no rings. The, um, this goes on and on. They uh, kind of got famous in the state for having a parkway, freeway, go through endangered species areas. And uh, they were tied up with Sierra Club, and it was the Audubon. Audubon came down and got a few resignations. Sierra Club says we let our people be autonomous, as long as they forward their share. And uh, which, at the time, the club was had 4,000 people in it. And the town was 70,000. Now that we're th 350,000, they're down to a couple hundred, but it works out pretty good because they're true believers. And they use, uh, as long as, I'm getting to this, two, two habitat plans. As long as you keep critters endangered, then you have a weapon. And the critters suffer and they're looking for open space, using the law as a way to get open space. They started as a park lobby and fine. But the way they're doing it, it's like their philosophical predecessors wanted open space, and at the time that open space was called Poland. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, I'm Karen King. I'm the CEO of Golden Empire Transit District and I'm here this evening representing the Kern Transportation Foundation. Uh, I believe you have one of these at your seats, but I brought extras and these have uh, a registration form attached to them, but I wanna draw your attention to a spring conference that the Kern Transportation Foundation is hosting on May 1st from 10 until 2 or 2.30, whenever we get finished talking. Uh, the focus of this conference is in, l intermodal transportation and logistics, and we'd love to have you and or your staff members attend this. We have speakers coming from the port, from BNSF, from the wonderful company, FedEx, 
Dollar General, and uh, our very own Rob Ball from Kern Cog will be on a panel as well. So please consider coming to the spring transportation conference. What's, what's the timing on that? I don't see that on the flyer. Oops. Thank you. Well, the only thing that Karen forgot to tell you is, is that it's being held at 201 New Stein Road at Stockdale Affairs. If you know where, the, where San Joaquin Valley College is located, it's on the south end of there. And the owner of that building has been very gracious because I know him very well to do this. Uh, I'm going to uh, somehow uh, mention something. I think it's in your jurisdiction. If it isn't, you ought to include it in there. And to a certain degree, uh, it might have a little bit of uh, pushback from this young man right here, but I have to tell you that in my young 86 years, I have learned that you cannot hold back progress, but you can manage it, and you can plan for it. And so what's happening at our place, 201 Newstein Road, is there is a new concept coming to Kern County. The name of it is called Startup Village. There's an 11,000 square foot wing of that building that's dedicated to building a place for individual people who work out of the office at home, uh, who uh, have their own businesses or want to build their own business and such as that. And this organization, this facility, is going to provide that kind of co-working experience. Uh, I just returned from a conference in Denver, and I will tell you that except for Bakersfield, this is absolutely lighting up the real estate world all over the country and out of the country. Now, the reason I think maybe there's a little bit of difference here is that we run a bus service from LAX to Bakersfield. Uh, a lot of people who understand the values uh, buy a house in Bakersfield and drive all the way to their jobs in Los Angeles, which creates a problem. Many individual car cars. So what we believe will happen is that these kinds of people who are uh, good citizens, people who spend money, uh, who support the community, that might now be living in Los Angeles, will locate here, have a place to do their co-working business, and if they have to go down to Los Angeles for a meeting, they can get on the Airport Valet Express. They go down there, and they come back the same day. It's only $22 each day, each way. So I think that this company, although it will provide uh, certainly a place for the people in our community, uh, it will also could become a very attractive uh, uh, way for people responsible people, tax-paying people that may want to move to Kern County and not bring and create a lot of uh, pollution like you're concerned about. Any questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> Seeing none, we move to the consent calendar item four. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kerncock staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. Does any member of the public wish to remove a consent agenda item? Does any member of the council wish to remove one? No, I'd make a motion to approve. Second. Roll call vote. Crump? Aye. Prout? Yes. Reyna? Yes. Mauer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Lucinovich? Aye. B. Smith? Yes. Couch. Yes. Fit. Yes. Kiernan. 
Yes. Para? Yes. And Miller? Yes. Thank you. Item five, Kern Electric Vehicle Charging Station Blueprint. Miss Urata. Good evening, everybody. Um, closer. Kern Council of Governments was awarded a grant from the California Energy Commission to develop a Kern Electric Vehicle Charging Station Blueprint. A draft document is posted to the Kern Cog website. Kern Cog invited comments to be submitted by April 9, 2019. This item uh, was presented to the TTAC on April 3rd, 2019. The California Energy Commission's Alternative and Renewable Fuel and Vehicle Technology Program awarded $200,000 of Phase I grant funding to Kern Council of Governments in partnership with the Center for Sustainable Energy to develop a Kern Electric Vehicle Charging Station, EVCS, blueprint. The purpose of the current EVCS blueprint is to accelerate the deployment of zero emission transportation to help reach Kern Cog 2018 Regional Transportation Plan air quality goals. Phase one is for the development of the planning blueprints by June 30th, 2019 to identify the actions and milestones needed to proceed towards implementation. Selection for phase one funding affords Kern Cog the opportunity to submit the completed, completed blueprint to compete for against the only, there were only nine recipients of this first phase money. So it's a small pool that's competing for the second phase of funding, um, which will be issued either the third or fourth quarter of this year. So for our implementation goals, um, some of them are to address greenhouse gas reductions and air quality conformity goals, as I mentioned for the 2018 regional transportation plan. It's also to um, create transportation infrastructure readiness where whether you're a visitor or a citizen or business person in Kern County, um, it's to establish enough charging stations that would be sufficient to serve the population. Um, electric vehicle and electric vehicle um, infrastructure awareness and adoption um, would be a result of implementing this plan and electric vehicle infrastructure affordability, reducing the cost and effort required to install electric vehicle infrastructure, which allows it to be deployed more quickly. Um, for the plan, there were two different scenarios that we looked at. The first is the EVI Pro, which is a program that was developed, it's a, it's a modeling program, um, and what that does is the state kind of predicts that electric vehicle sales will take place faster in high density areas such as San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego where the, in, where the EVs are already being deployed at higher numbers and faster rates. Um, the second scenario that they looked at was a population base, which is how we came up with our 4,000 roughly spaces that would be needed um, to do our share of the 2025 zero emission vehicle goal from the governor's office. So that's why in the plan we address both options and obviously scenario B is much more aggressive than what the state um, would have asked of us. Um, our next steps for this plan, um, the Center for Sustainable Energy is working on a high impact site appendix. That work is beginning um, this next month. Um, we're beginning outreach on the plan itself and there'll be draft toolkits for us to adapt to address different segments of um, the EV charging station, uh, places where people would install charging, like multi-unit dwellings, public agencies, and so on. So there'll be different toolkits for addressing those different um, locations. Um, we have a working group that um, helps with this plan as a kind of an advisory group, and their next meeting will be on May 17th. Um, it'll be focused on outreach. Some of them will do this outreach for us, and so they're going to be trained in how to do the outreach and re reviewing those toolkits and materials as part of that process. Um, as far as the final draft, um, we will be presenting a final draft. Actually, that date just changed yesterday. So we'll be presenting the final draft of the blueprint to the RPAC and TTAC on June 5th. Um, we're presenting the final blueprint. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We're presenting the final draft on May 1st, that's correct. And then on June 5th, we'll be presenting the final document to the RPAC and TTAC and bringing it back to your board at the June 20th meeting. And then throughout the month of June, we'll be distributing toolkits and collecting information from our initial triad outreach. 
Um, and then we have a final report to submit to the CEC for our grant, and that's due on July 1st. In your board um, folders, you'll see a handout with the same kind of slide cover. And what ha is in there is kind of the short list. We had they identified through a, a process 47 charging stations throughout Kern County. Um, as you might know, one of our goals of this project is to develop 12 high impact um, stations where we could actually build a station within the next year or so and use that as an example of all of the different categories, whether it's a workplace or a multi-unit dwelling or a public agency or a destination. So I'm uh, providing this to you. We're, um, the working group at their meeting last Friday went through and had an interactive activity. Um, by all means, you can go through this, and if you feel strongly about one site over another in your community or in somebody else's, um, by all means, you can provide that information back to me at lurata at kerncog.org by May 7th, and it'll be incorporated into the plan where now CSE will be going out and doing site evaluations, talking to the building owners to see if they're willing to be a site host, those kinds of efforts. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to make a note is um, if you're wondering how quickly they're being adopted right now, we're aware of about 59 projects in Kern County where charging stations are being installed. And um, the one on Panera, at the Panera on California, today I saw them pouring concrete. They have four stations going in. We hope that those will be open perhaps as early um, as the end of this month. So it's rapidly deploying um, in our area and this plan will help us move it along especially in the outlying communities so thank you thank you four thousand seems like a pretty aggressive number <laughs> <laughs> it does help us meet the the goals of the state to have 1.5 million electric vehicles over the road um, by 2025 and that's kind of um, it will also help us meet our, as I said, our air quality goals and greenhouse gas reduction so targets. So are the installations all privately funded or there's? There's actually quite a lot of funding coming out and existing already for EV charging. Some of those charging stations that are going in are um, privately funded or they use um, state grants and local grants um, to su supplement. Um, Electrify America <coughs> as part of their settlement for um, with California Air Resources Board over a cheating device that they had on their vehicles. Um, they're installing three stations along Highway 58 in Kern County. Um, so that's definitely their money because that's part of their, um, their penalty. But the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District and the Eastern Kern Air Pollution Control District both have grant funds to put in charging stations. Um, coming out this fall or by the end of the year, there's the Cal EVIP, which is a program from the California Energy Commission, they're going to be providing um, $5.25 million to put in charging stations and hydrogen stations in Kern County. Um, so there's a whole variety of funding available for this. Um, the $5 million is just for Kern County? Yes, $5.25. How, how much does a charging station it depends on what st size station you're putting in. I mean, for what we put in over at the Amtrak, those posts alone were roughly $2,000 to $4,000. Um, if you're putting in a fast charger, like Electrify America will do, those can run $40,000 just for the equipment. And then depending on how close you are to the transformer, how much trenching you have to do, um, the programs can be inexpensive in the $10,000 to $20,000 range, or they can be up to the million dollar range, just depending on what it is you're doing. Okay, uh, I want you to mark your calendar and give me a report in 2025. Tell <laughs> me how many you have. I'll be retiring <laughs> before then. <so. laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I have a question. Sure. These stations, uh, judging by what you're talking about, that, that it costs so much to put them in, uh, are they going to? charge a fee for charging a vehicle? That also varies from location to location. Um, the, the stations over at the Amtrak are free. If you're doing a long dwell parking, you can charge for free at the Amtrak station, whereas just two blocks the other way, if you're at the Kern Community College District, it's roughly $10 for a four-hour stay. 
So it varies greatly depending on what you're doing. Some employers will be, able, will be giving charging away to their employees, others will charge a fee. And it's again a matter too, if you want to turn over the space, you might charge a fee just so you're not tying up one car to one charger the whole day. So there'll be some performance pricing as well. And that was uh, one of my thoughts that if you are giving it away for free, somebody could just park the entire there, day there and uh, not allow anybody else to use it. So, right, right. So, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Are, are the Amtrak chargers getting used much? Do we know? They're not at max capacity yet. They put in four chargers and they put in enough stubs so they can add two more. So um, if it gets to capacity, they can easily add two more stations. Great. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Fox. Please come to the microphone. Then. Please. Yes, please. Yeah, I was wondering, is, are you tying in with this concept of Seattle to San Diego for trucks, semis running electric semis? That they came yeah, up and with actually the next week days? I'll be headed to the 2019 Advanced Clean Transportation Expo in Long Beach, and they've shown, you know, like the Tesla super truck that Shell actually operates, and it's the size of this room. Um, there's projects going on. There's um, electric transportation refrigerated units. Um, those will be tested this next year or two up in the Modesto Stockton area. Frito Lay is exploring that also out of their Modesto area that may end up at the Frito Lay plant here. So there's quite a lot of interest in over the road trucking that's battery electric. <laughs> Hello, John Polaris, uh, 1041 uh, eighth place in Wasco. Um, but you're saying that these sites selected uh, is still early enough to change them? We're making a selection down to 12 from the, this is the final. We started, if you look at our blueprint that's online, you'll see we have um, hundreds of locations identified in Kern County. It was narrowed down through a selection process to 47, which will then be narrowed down to 12. Okay, and uh, how long does it take to recharge? Yeah, that depends actually on the car that you drive. It's how long that car is able to, how quickly that car is able to accept the charge. Um, so if you're at a DC fast charger like we have at the Walmart station down on Panama um, or up in Delano, it can take as little as 20 minutes to charge your car. If you're charging on a level one charger at your house, it'll take you eight hours. Dep and that's just a basic rule of thumb. Again, it varies from car to car. It's different if you're a Tesla owner versus any other car. Okay, well, for the uh, Wasco site three and five, uh, perhaps we could look for a different location. Um, 20 minutes on uh, a hot summer day would probably be too much <laughs> for me. This. There's, there's no amenities around there uh, to keep you occupied. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that input. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Phil Rudnick again. Uh, I am familiar with the uh, alternative energy as sources for transportation. Uh, and I'm familiar with the fact that apparently the conventional wisdom is that battery energy from batteries uh, is the uh, preferred choice for automobiles. Uh, what we have found is that the preferred choice for the large transportation, the large trucks that you see on the highways, is hydrogen fuel cell energy. Takes the same amount of time to, uh, to uh, fuel a uh, truck as it would to fill it with diesel and the uh, effluent that you get out of it is water and so it's uh, a very very important for our community for our county uh, to see that we are in the forefront and I'm pleased to tell you thanks to Supervisor Couch are you up David thanks to Supervisor Couch 
we have a piece of property, my son and I, that if we were going to devote to music, that we are now devoting to the production of, hy of hydrogen fuel cell energy, and we hope to be a major uh, uh, location for trucks that will not use diesel and not pollute the air. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get a good response when we get to the Board of Supervisors <laughs> on that one. <laughs> and if anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm here to answer them for you. It's called Cal Center. It's, the, it's out there at 7th Standard and I-5. Yeah, you and I have talked about that before, so we'll, we'll be talking about that again, I'm sure. Okay, just uh, keep me informed if we can be of any help on whatever you do here, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Ms. Shirata. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have item six, triennial performance audit for fiscal year 2016 to 18, Mr. Smith. Uh, yes, Chairman Smith, members of the committee. Um, Kern Cog entered into a uh, contract with Moore & Associates in October of 2018 to evaluate the uh, performance evaluation of the transit systems in Kern Cog. Um, tonight is the conclusion, or near the conclusion of the, the report. <coughs> I have Mr. Jim Moore of Moore & Associates, and he'll give the presentation. Thank you, Peter. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the council. So this is uh, a performance audit, not a fiscal audit. And then as a performance audit, its prime purpose is to assess compliance with the Transportation Development Act. And the PUC requires that an independent performance audit be conducted of Kern Cog as the RTPA, the Regional Transportation Planning Agency, as well as any entity to which it allocates TDA funds. And these audits, these independent audits, are to be conducted on a every three-year basis. Morn Associates is a transit-focused consulting firm based in Southern California. And uh, we have been in business for 30 years. And we were selected to conduct this audit via a competitive bid process. So what's included is a, a test of compliance, an assessment of the status of prior recommendations, prior audit recommendations review of goal setting and strategic planning specific to the RTPA, a verification of performance criteria and indicators for each of the operators, and then a functional review, whether it's planning, marketing, administration, maintenance, et cetera, and then the presentation of the findings and recommendations. The audit includes two types of findings, uh, a compliance finding, which is dictated by the Transit Development Act but more and associates based on its transit only focus <laughs> includes also a functional finding where appropriate uh, based on our professional insight. So the process included data collection, compliance review, a site visit where we met with uh, not only the RTPA, but every operator throughout the county, uh, their senior staff. We also made a tour and documentation of the transit facilities. And then again, we come back to the reporting. In terms of the RTPA compliance, um, many of these findings are already uh, in progress, or their resolution is already in progress. We found that the RTPA generally functions in an efficient and effective and economical manner. Uh, however, several operators, they uh, failed to file their TDA fiscal audits within the allowable time frame or within also the 90-day extension period. And the RTPA also did not certify in writing to Caltrans that the performance operators had been completed during the prior cycle. They also need to uh, update some of the rules and regulations regarding uh, revenue ratios, fare box revenue ratios. As you may know, if, if an operator, transit operator, is operating uh, chiefly in a rural area, there's a 10% fare box recovery standard. If they're operating in an urbanized area, it's a 20% fare box recovery standard. And then there is an operator such as the county 
which operates both in rural and in urban area that has a blended rate or a mixed rate. So in terms of some of the functional findings, which don't affect compliance, but uh, we provided because of our insight as uh, transit-only consultants. Uh, again, several transit operators continue to struggle meeting the TDA stipulated fare box recovery ratio. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, some uh, did not uh, verify, the RTPA did not verify the uh, state transit assistance eligibility as part of the TDA claim process. The claim process has already been addressed there and also did not require some of the operators to submit performance data or evidence of progress in meeting some of the prior audit recommendations. I'm happy to report of the 12 operators, three actually had no compliance findings, uh, which is very significant. City of Arvin had both compliance and functional findings. Um, in case not meeting the 10% fare box recovery, uh, not utilizing the proper full-time equivalent definition, <coughs> And that's a very common finding, and that is because uh, in the National Transit Database and State Controller Reports or Fiscal Audits, uh, the definition of a full-time equivalent is 2080. However, in the TDA compliance, the, defin is two th the definition is 2000. So it's very easy to make that error. Uh, that is something that is being discussed. Uh, there's an informal working group uh, of operators throughout California that has been meeting for the last several months talking about ways of updating the TDA, the Transit Development Act, as it relates to audits because it was something that was developed back in the 1970s and certainly the market and market conditions and compliance, et cetera, have changed dramatically since that time. Uh, in terms of some functional findings for the City of Arvin, there was uh, some fair revenue handling concerns and also in terms of uh, how they filed the state controller report. For the City of California City, again, we also had compliance findings and functional findings. Again, concerns, some challenges meeting that 10% uh, fare box recovery ratio, uh, a definition issue, and also uh, being able to provide evidence of timely submittal of uh, state controllers reports. And also uh, the last being um, still some outstanding recommendations from the 2012 Transit Development Plan. City of Delano. Again, both compliance and functional findings. You see again, late submittal of a state controller report, challenges regarding the uh, fare box ratio, um, some inconsistent data, and then some uh, reporting discrepancies between the various documents, whether it's state controller reports, national transit database, fiscal audits, et cetera. Golden Empire Transit had a uh, clean audit in terms of uh, compliance, no compliance finding, and just a single functional finding and again, that very common mistake about uh, calculation of the full-time equivalent, which is something I said uh, operators are working with the state to uh, refine how that uh, definition is being applied. The county of Kern also had uh, no, fun no compliance findings. It did have, a, so it was essentially a clean audit as defined by the TDA. Had some functional findings. Again, some uh, concerns about uh, data reporting. <laughs> And they actually uh, failed to exclude some operating costs, which if they had done it, would have actually had boosted the fare box recovery ratio and made them look yeah, even better. City of McFarland, both compliance findings and functional findings, again, fairly common ones there. Um, what uh, McFarland also uh, didn't uh, exclude some uh, costs and revenues associated with the trial weekend service. Uh, even though they had been eligible to do so. And in our opinion, they actually, the city of McFarland's fare box recovery probably would have been boosted uh, even further. The uh, CTSA, again, uh, challenges meeting the fare box standard, uh, due in large part due to the uh, change regarding the Medi-Cal reimbursements, some definition uh, calculation errors, as well as just overall challenges in terms of increasing costs and uh, declining funding. City of Ridgecrest, as with a number of the other operators, did not meet the 10% fare box recovery in one of the three years during the audit period, and then had many of the same uh, findings that you saw on some of the prior operators. The city of Shafter was uh, absolutely clean, had no uh, compliance or functional findings, which I believe this is the second consecutive cycle in which Shafter uh, achieved that. 
city of Taft, uh, in terms of compliance, only one finding, and it's really that minor one, which is the definition, and then also not distinguishing uh, in some of their fiscal audits regarding fair revenues and uh, supplemental revenues, which such as uh, advertising revenues or local contributions, things of that nature, which again would have potentially boosted the fair box recovery. City of Tehachapi, in a challenge meeting, uh, the fair box recovery, and some uh, definition issues here, and also uh, they declined or had yet to implement some of the recommendations from the 2012 transit development plan. City of Wasco, yeah, uh, concern there about uh, the definition of full-time equivalent, the fare box issue, uh, some functional findings regarding staffing capacity. It's a very modest staffing uh, in the city of Wasco, and they have not updated their dollar ride policy in some time. But again, that's uh, an issue that Moore and Associates has worked with uh, most of the operators working through to resolve those issues, uh, particularly like in the case of Wasco with the dollar ride manual. So that's a very quick overview. Um, as I said, while there are f some compliance findings, uh, many of them deal with uh, improper or incorrect definition of full-time equivalent calculation, which is a fairly common uh, finding. Also, the ongoing challenges regarding the uh, fare box recovery and the, the timely filing of uh, the fiscal audits and uh, some of the state controller reports. So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, if there's any questions you or the council may have, I will do my best to respond to those. Thank you. Any questions from the council? I do. Yes. Uh, regarding Wasco, is the city able to go back uh, and fix any of these findings, or is that beyond uh, fixing, for lack of a better word? Thank you for that question. Uh, this audit period closed June 30th, uh, 2018. So the snapshot is actually complete. But what we have done, um, because we truly value our relationship with the COG and each of the operators, we've spent some additional time uh, working with the individual operators, particularly the smaller operators where the staffing may be modest and they may be doing uh, tasks other than transit. They might be in community development or engineering or something of that nature to work with them, council member, and so as to be able to provide a path forward we're being able to eliminate a future finding, a future similar finding. Thank you. And how often are, are these audits done? The audits are done every three years, on a three-year cycle, three fiscal years. So the next one will be uh, you know, through the period uh, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. We look to do better. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Go to the microphone, please. Go to the microphone, please, Mr. Fox. I was just in Dennis Fox. I was just in L.A. And they come by. They have these big blue buses. And guess what's written all over the side? Big blue bus. Now, I kind of figured that out on my own. Up here, I noticed we have some advertising and some really kind of fun-looking artwork. I was just wondering if it's cost-effective, if it's income and stuff. Just kind of Mr. thought Chairman? about it yesterday. Thank I you. I was worried about the big blue bus, that, or, what it was. Mr. Akimi, you got an answer. So uh, adver advertising on, on the buses or, or the vans is considered income, and it is calculated. Um, uh, it's part of the calculation of, of It's an eligible contribution. In, in fact, previously, uh, we talked about uh, Supervisor Couch's efforts to get the Air District, to, uh, who has previously spent a lot of money on advertising in Kern County, on billboards, on the radio, on TV, and just over this last year has started advertising on um, Golden Empire Transit buses, Delano buses. I think the county? And I think the county. Yeah. And we, KernCog actually also advertises mm -hmm. on the buses, yes. so we use our own money to help our agencies with income. And that, Mr. Chair, is an eligible local match contribution. Great. Any other questions? One question. 
Mr. Smith. Does the advertising uh, offset if you're not making the 10 percent fare box? Goes does that it. add to it? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Um, advertising, uh, local uh, donations, business donations, uh, um, uh, you know, special operational monies, uh, fuel, you know, CNG fuel credits or fuel sales. Those are all now allowable contributions to the fare box. Okay. Thank you. Thank Seeing you. No other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Shafter. Maybe it's worth noting that of our vans that we have, you know, they, um, well, we're, we're getting grants that we're going to improve and increase the passenger park, but we've covered our vans, the city has, promoting the graduated students as well as our learning center and education and of course we get no funds back but it's been very effective to do that great yeah looks good thank you item number eight caltrans report uh oh On number six, the performance audit, we need a motion. Make a motion to adopt the staff's recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Pass. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Caltrans report. Good evening. Um, quite a few projects as before. Try and keep my pages in line here so I don't have to ask John where I am. So we're going to start with um, Formoso 4699 Bridge replacement. Uh, right now they're doing some miscellaneous shoulder and punch list work. There still is going to be some traffic control. Um, going on uh, they're going to do some shoulder closures and, um, and they're doing that for the purpose of trying to complete the punch list items there are going to be um, some nightly closures lanes and ramps uh, that may be needed next week from Sunday to Thursday to complete still some of the work of uh, punch list items um, moving on to the Taft Highway rehabilitation project um, on 99 near the city of Bakersfield from north of Herring Road to Pacheco Road. Those are the on over crossings. Work is currently, this is the work that's currently scheduled for the next 30 days. Southbound outside shoulder work, northbound medium work. Uh, they're going to be doing some trimming of the vegetation, roadside excavation, some asphalt. That'll be from David to Cor David slash Corpus Christi Road to the old US 99 overcrossing. There'll be some possibly some panel replacements in the number one lane from the I-5 to 99 junction to 166 um, overcrossing. There's traffic control going on too. Um, they're going to be extending the uh, lane closure of the northbound number one lane and that would be from the Davis and Corpus Christi Road to the US 99 overcrossing. Nightly closures on, in, that would um, consist of some closures of lanes and ramps from Sunday to Thursday uh, to complete that work. Ramp closures are currently um, they're not ramp closures are not currently anticipated, but it could happen. Uh, State Route 46, that's the um, segment 4A, widening 46 from two to four lanes. That's between Lost Hills Road and I-5. Uh, deck pouring is scheduled for next week. T contractor has also scheduled a 55-hour closure starting April 26 for the Kern 5 southbound off-ramp to construct that new off-ramp. 
and there'll be some asphalt and then um, concrete pavement also uh, should be completed though by the end of June. The State Route 99, um, also a pavement rehabilitation. This is going to, the limits on this are in Kern County from 0.3 miles south of Palm Avenue over Chrysler crossing to Beardsley Canal Bridge and then on State Route 178 at the 99 and 178 separation. Work currently scheduled for the next 30 days is northbound medium work from south of Palm Avenue overcrossing to just north of um, State Route 204 overcrossing. Possible uh, panel replacements in the number one lane from Olive Avenue to Beersley Canal. Uh, there are, again will be some traffic control going on, extended lane closures. Uh, those closures are currently in place and will not be reopened until traffic in 2021. Uh, lane number one northbound has been closed from State Route 58 overcrossing to just north of State Route 204 overcrossing. Lane also number one southbound has been closed from Beardsley Canal to just south of Palm Avenue overcrossing. Again, nightly closure, closures of adjacent lanes may be needed uh, from Sunday to Thursday to complete that work. Only one closure will be permitted one closure will be permitted per direction. Ramp closures, again, they're not anticipating that. Cottonwood East Rehabilitation, uh, pavement rehabilitation on State Route 58 in Bakersfield from Cottonwood Road under crossing to just east of State Route 158 and the 184 separation. The medium work is complete, uh, but work is continuing on the eastbound number three lane and shoulder. There's some excavation, excavation of the westbound lanes that has just started. Moving on to Cache Creek Bridge replacement. So replacing the bridge on 58, eight miles east of Tehachapi from Sand Canyon overhead to 0.5 miles east of Cache Creek. Uh, contract was approved March 21st. Construction is anticipated to start in May, so I'll be giving you those construction details uh, very soon. The summit overhead bridge rails, that's just replacing the bridge rails on 58 near to Hashby at Summit uh, overhead. Uh, the pre-construction meeting was held uh, back in February and um, they have now moved, um, the construction date was supposed to be March 1st, but it's been moved due to out because um, they're still coordinating with um, Union Pacific Railroad. So hopefully next, um, my next report next month will have some activity. Uh, Laredo Canal medium gap closure. Uh, they're doing medium deck closures, medium deck closure near Bakersfield at Laredo Canal on State Route 58. The contract was approved um, March 20th. No work is currently scheduled because they're dealing with some migratory birds who have been, um, who are present on the structure and a nearby raptor nest. So hopefully next month we'll have that resolved. Um, Bell Terrace overcrossing, that's to construct an auxiliary lane, replace the Bell <coughs> Terrace bridge on 99. The bridge is down, um, the bridge is down, critical path is in, delay due to, oh, this is, yeah, there's some soil conditions they're dealing with on the northbound 99 at the nail wall. The wall there is um, what they call non-cohesive sandy conditions. So it's causing some problems. And so the city, um, to, to address this, the city is having the contractor perform some soil mixing stabilization. Uh, the California Aqueduct bridge overlay project on I-5 and 99. Um, that's to improve the uh, loading rate um, and that we are, they're still waiting for the con uh, contractors to start that construction. So I'm hoping next month to be able to report on that. And then we've got I-5-99 bridge separation and pavement re rehabilitation uh, 99 I-5 junction to Panama Lane overcrossing. The project will rehab the northbound 
um, outside lanes and shoulders from 99 five, I-599 split to the old US 99. They're also going to do some um, concrete pavement there. This will improve the vertical clearance um, at that bridge in both directions. That's supposed to start um, mid, well, actually it was probably should be starting very, very soon. So I should be able to report on that next month. Uh, it's scheduled, they say, for late April. Well, this is late April to me. So I'm assuming if it hasn't already started, it should be. Uh, Stockdale Enos Roundabout, uh, that is all I know. That's Construct Roundabout at 43 and Stockdale Highway. Um, they're saying spring, so that's coming upon us soon. The 119 and 43 intersection improvement, that's another roundabout at that intersection. Environmental got their uh, approval from California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, and to relocate um, and to do the relocate, their relocation plan was approved and the contractor will be starting installation of uh, the exclusion fencing that's um, to uh, close off the environmentally sensitive area. Um, they did that on April 11th. Contractor anticipates finish, finishing it by mid week or next week. The biologists are scheduled to start conducting and trapping and relocating the uh, protected species uh, next week. If all goes well, actual work should start as soon as May 1st. And that concludes my report. Thank you, District 9. Yes, thank you. I passed out a, uh, we have our monthly report and also the, um, most of the, the highlights are probably in the construction map, our yearly construction map that we, um, I passed out. And Gail covered a couple of those, the bridge, the bridge rails and the bridge replacement, but uh, I'll just touch on a few of interest. The, um, the District 9 um, Zero Emission Vehicle Project, the ZEV, we're, good, we're planning on at the, both the eastbound and westbound safety roadside rest in Boron, putting in um, uh, zero emission vehicle charging stations. Those will be class three chargers. So it kind of goes along with what we were just discussing earlier and those will be public um, free stations because they're in the safety roadside rest um, really the only other um, thing that's con currently going at the moment is this SB1 striping has started on State Route 58 and that is adding the six inch um, removing and replacing the, the stripes that are on the highway that are um, now standard and are picked up by the automatic, uh, kind of by your semi-automated vehicles. So that's going. Um, on the update, the major things to just, nothing has really changed for um, most of these. Um, the, I will uh, call attention to number three, or the third one there, the Rosamond Mojave Rehab on State Route 14. Uh, we had a sh funding shortfall from that, but we were able to pick up some money from another district in the north part of the state so that we have secured that funding um, and that will be voted at the next CTC meeting and so we should be able <coughs> to do construction um, it should RTL this fall. So we, it'll be construction, well actually it'll s construct next summer, but moving forward with that. Um, and Last on the last page of this, we have the um, truck climbing lane. We're continuing to work on that. Uh, our environmental staff was actually out there this week um, doing the preliminary environmental scoping. So we're continuing on that work and we're expecting to be able to have that feasibility study or the, the PID on that finished up by the end of the calendar year is what we're hoping for. Um, we are also working on an ITS study and we would that will be presented at the next TTAC in May, here. Uh, May, f I don't know, the beginning of May, whenever that is. Yeah. Um, I believe that's it. We did, Caltrans um, puts out his, the mile marker, and um, in this last mile marker that came out this quarter, it did have a two-page spread about the Freeman Gulch 
widening project. So I just, it's, um, I have a few copies of that for if anybody would want one, but just a special thank you again to Kern Cog for that project and for District 6. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Yes. Uh, as it pertains to the uh, State Route 46, State Route 99, I want to ask, um, there's a completely new traffic pattern there, and um, the, as you are moving eastbound on Highway 46 and entering southbound on Highway 99, that on-ramp um, is that going to receive any railing? Do you know? Oh, on the side, so you don't go over the rail. Is okay. as you as rail? you enter? <coughs> yes. Um, those kind of those were not in, included. My I have no idea. I mean, I, I it's an easy ask to ask the uh, RE or contractor about it. So I can. That's information that's easy. Would you, would you find that out? Because uh, as I approach this ramp, I look at vehicles. Some of them may be going too fast, and it would be very easily for one of them to go off the ramp. And it's quite a steep ramp. And also uh, a request I as you exit Highway 99 going north onto Highway 46, because of the new traffic pattern, there is a big bright light that is placed uh, on the west side of that uh, overpass, and that blinds drivers at night that are turning left um, on to going to Wasco on Highway 46. And maybe the solution might be to place, instead of one light, two lights, and face them down rather than forward. And that, that's something that I usually refer to our uh, safety um, traffic engineer. So I'll, I'll do that when I get back to the office, and they'll, they'll investigate that. Thank it, you. Yeah. I would appreciate it. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, executive director's report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I have a handful of items on this agenda. Um, Gail and several other people have mentioned uh, the progress on Route 46. Um, the project team, which is uh, represented by Kern County, Kern Cog, Caltrans, and FHWA, has set up a standing meeting each month. I want to thank um, all of the cities that um, provided resolutions in support of uh, finishing Route 46. Those have been forwarded to Caltrans. I also wanted to thank uh, the County of Kern for hiring um, City of Bakersfield's former uh, right-of-way manager uh, who will be dedicated to acquiring the right-of-way on this project. We, we are making progress and we are going to meet uh, at least once a month, in some cases twice a month, including a meeting uh, a week from tomorrow that Supervisor Couch is likely to attend. Um, the CTC and the Air Resources Board uh, held, held a joint meeting last last week on April 9th. Uh, Mr. Ball was in attendance. April 29th, the Kern County Association of Cities is meeting in Ridgecrest. Uh, I'll be attending as well as Ms. Ms. Napier. Any of you on the Valley side want to ride over? Let us know and we can carpool. Um, this is for you and or your staff. The California Transportation Commission is holding a Funding 101 workshop. I know several of your uh, cities have newer employees, including newer uh, public works directors in some cases. That, that will be held April 30th in Sacramento. It will also be webcast um, at the same time. If you're interested, contact the COG. But April 30th, CTC Funding 101 workshop. Uh, Ms. King from Golden Empire Transit mentioned the KTF Spring Transportation Conference. It's worth another uh, another mention here. May 1st, Stockdale Affairs Event Center. And there is something in your folder about that, too. Uh, finally, on this agenda, the CTC will be meeting in San Diego in May on the 15th and 16th. We will have staff there, and there will be um, 
at least two, possibly as many as four items on the agenda affecting uh, our member agencies. Subject to any of your questions, uh, Mr. Chairman or board members, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions for the director? Any member statements? I have one really quick. Yes. I just wanted to, th earlier we had the microtransit report from uh, Get Staff, and I just wanted to, even though Ricardo and DK have left already, staff really took hold of this idea and really ran with it, and they did an excellent job from HR to having hiring days and uh, going up to Sacramento to visiting different places that have implemented microtransit and for Bakersfield to be one of the first places to have it is just amazing and for once we're not one of the last pl places to have something and um, I think I, I just wanted to, to thank staff again for really running with this project and getting it started thank you <laughs> oh, one other thing. May is bike month. So look on the Kern Cog website, uh, Blue Sky Partners, bake ba Bike Bakersfield's website. There'll be partnerships between Bike Bakersfield and Get on riding Get with your bike. And, and there'll be some uh, giveaways if you take a picture and, and a hashtag. I'm not sure what the hashtag is right now, but if you hashtag Get and Bike Bakersfield, you'll be entered uh, every week in a drawing if you use the bus and your bike. Thank you. I had one question on uh, item J on the consent calendar. There was the, the uh, Buena Vista bike path extension I know has been extended for a year and, and I would just like staff to follow up on that maybe and check with the county staff. I know Supervisor Couch worked hard to get that, and, then, and it seems to be dragging. If you could, please. We, we will do that, and I have a quick update if you want it. Great. Uh, the county just received notice, I believe, yesterday that they got approval on the environmental document. Uh, that means that they can move forward with um, the final piece of right-of-way that is required. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, moving on to current Council of Governments. Roll call is the same. Public comments. Do we have any public comments for current Council of Governments? Seeing none. Consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are again are going to be voted on at once. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the consent agenda? Or does staff wish to pull anything off or, or council members? No. Motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Roll call vote. Trump? Aye. Prout? Yes. Reyna? Yes. Mauer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Lucinovich? Aye. B. Smith? Yes. Vick? Yes. Kiernan? Yes. Para? Miller. Sorry. Thank you. I'll vote yes, too. <laughs> <laughs> Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, Mr. Uh, Chairman and Board Members. On April 3rd, uh, Council Member Vallejo from um, Delano and I attended our annual Valley Voice meeting with the seven other uh, San Joaquin Valley uh, counties in Sacramento. It was a, a productive meeting. This, this year was a one-day-only affair. Um, I'll be glad to uh, talk to you more about that one-on-one -on -one if any of you want to know who we met with. Uh, all four agreements that uh, you directed me to enter into with the CHP have been uh, complete. We've we now have an agreement with Fort Tejon, Button Willow, Bakersfield, and Mojave areas of CHP uh, for additional enforcement if we need it, uh, hot spots, uh, and we will uh, likely see 
the commanders of each one of those four areas visit with us in the, in the next few months. They also asked me to remind you that April is Distracted Driving Awareness Month, I think it's called. So please don't drive uh, distracted. <laughs> Uh, the San, San Joaquin Valley uh, Annual Policy Conference is May 8th to 10th in Lemoore. Um, I will be attending along with Mr. Ball, who will be uh, presenting on um, freight issues. If any of you are interested in attending that, please let me know. Again, May 8th to 10th in Lemoore. Um, when uh, Council Member Smith took over in December and uh, Supervisor Scribner took over as vice chairman. It, it triggered an action that we need to take um, on our executive committee. The executive committee consists of the chairman and the vice chairman <coughs> and one additional item, but there's a special condition in there when specifically Bakersfield and the county hold the chair and the vice chairman respectively. So I'll be coming back to you next month to ask the full board to approve appoint a third member to that executive committee. The executive committee is a standing committee that um, hasn't met in a couple years, but does. Uh, I would like to meet with them sometime in late May to discuss some um, financial issues. So uh, if you could think about that, if you have any questions about that, I'll be bringing it back next month to make an appointment to that. And I, I would ask whoever um, is appointed to that, uh, think about being available for at least one meeting with both the chairman and the vice chairman and myself. And finally, uh, in your folder this evening is uh, our outreach efforts over the last month, dated April 18th, timeline covering the, the next six months, <coughs> the District 9 uh, Kern County Project Summary that Mr. Fit, w Fit went over, our schedule of cash disbursements for March, a very interesting article on uh, <coughs> fare evasion on the bus system of, of New York and very interesting um, views of the people that have been interviewed who evade the fares. Our progress report for projects of regional significance a copy of the uh, Miss Urata's presentation and a two-sided uh, flyer for the 2019 KTF conference. Details are on the back. That will be held May 1st, 9 a.m. to 2 o'clock uh, in Bakersfield. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman and board members, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions for the director? Seeing none, any member statements? We're done. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>